out of the blue, I got a call one day uh, asking if I was interested to do a competition in, as a collaborative process. I, I actually thought it was a joke at first. Uh, but then when John said that the deadline is in three days, I realized, well, he's either really crazy or he's absolutely <laughs> serious. <laughs> Well, it was one of those things uh, brought together by a series of occurrences, an invitation that Nadir had to come to Melbourne and make a really great magazine coverage of a talk that he gave and then uh, a coverage of some of his recent projects that was attractive to us. So we actually missed uh, a geographical link and actually through reading evidence of it, um, started a conversation which related very directly to um, the speculation on this competition commission. There was a broad agreement that we're both invested in a process whereby we start everything together and we end everything together. But even the way in which uh, the agreement has been set up is that we will have a quite a prominent uh, presence in the CA process. And for the nature of practice, I think these conversations have gone back into both practices in a really significant way. I think it's the, the sort of things that we've talked about and now talked about um, in quite broad terms within our practice. Even the way of presenting ideas um, in, a, in a new graphic form, uh, there is a series of things that now have extended our conversations back within the office. Once we started working together, I realised that we actually arrive at very similar things through very different processes. Mm -hmm. And so, Part of uh, the collaborative process proves to you uh, not only that ideas may be better from somebody else, but that the process of how you get there uh, can be many. And so you, you become less precious about your own little rationale. Yeah. It was a two-stage competition, yeah. meaning that in the first stage we only had to develop what I think was seven spreads or something very, very limited. Mm -hmm. And we had to jot down ideas very fast. And the way in which we did that was that uh, their office would produce something uh, for 12 hours, hand it off to ours. Mm -hmm. We would do a 12-hour response to theirs or a development and add it to their package. And it went back and forth for about uh, 72 hours. Mm -hmm. And then we submitted it. It's been a building created out of lengthy conversations. Mm -hmm. We're literally working 24 hours. We would have these Skype sessions at the start and end of every day. And North and South Hemisphere, uh, and charge up these ideas. And it was innately lengthy, highly conversational, mm. and it was both so incredibly efficient, we literally worked around the clock, but um, inefficient in this remarkable conversation. And out of that inefficiency, I think, comes a, a lot of good practice. I think we treated the, the working platform as a completely horizontal free-for-all. Mm. When you're working on a shared desktop platform, mm. Mm. you are literally allowed to draw on each other's drawings. Mm. Uh, what is traditionally thought of as the sacred ground mm. of your own tablet is all of a sudden being added onto and contaminated by another person's hand. And that is probably the most important and refreshing aspect of collaboration. You simply have to be open yeah. to being corrected. The most amazingly beautiful and haphazard and weird and wonderful um, diagrams and over sketchings that actually mm. layer both the presentation of the ideas and its further development mm. in both really finely wrought and quite true, crude terms um, in the ebb and flow of the design processes mm. of the job. We were really thinking about uh, those conceptual categories that Tom had put on the table, the, the notion of a pedagogical building. But there are eccentricities, biases, and architectural agendas that are not necessarily rational. They're not a direct mirror mm. of the program. Mm. They're not a direct mm. mirror of mm the structural necessities, they're invented uh, predicaments and inventive challenges and they go to not only material usage but you know the, 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 the entire way in which the central space was programmed, furnished, structured, daylighted, the suspended studio, all of that um, is the result 
uh, not of a linear process, but a much more mm. chaotic back and forth that produces, in my mind, what is one of the most powerful spaces of the project. One of the most enduring bits of master plan is Bryce Mortlock's plan for the campus, aspects of which still are provided as creditable information for new buildings to be created on campus now. So, and he talked about a series of urban rooms. He, he observed what, what existed, which were great landscape spaces between buildings and how they functioned as spaces in their own right. They weren't passive spaces. They actually were active and closed spaces enclosed by the, the external walls of surrounding buildings that created a series of distinct uh, urban rooms. There was a, a, a deep sense of the recognition that we're not doing a building on campus. We're doing a piece of urbanism mm. uh, uh, of which the building is a part. Mm. We're overly polite with each other. And I think after a while as we've got mm. to know each other more we've cut conversations short. We've probably, we now know each other and, and, and um, know how to kind of find um, more efficiency in the routes that we take. Witnessing how he works with his team has also been a process for me to understand how to construct priorities. Mm -hmm. you, you actually don't need to control everything all the way. That It's probably better to let uh, your collaborators and your team to run with certain things because ultimately you don't really lose control over a project. You simply insert yourself where you are critical to it mm -hmm. because the chances are they're going to do a better job on that part that you're not critical to. Mm -hmm.